I'm Kendra Gurney. I'm the New England Regional Science Coordinator for the American Chestnut Foundation. So I oversee, we have volunteer, volunteer state chapters in all of our New England states. And this morning we are planting with our Connecticut chapter in Litchfield. Uh, we will be planting a little over 100 seeds and a couple seedlings this morning. Most of them are what we call third back cross trees. So they're um, our breeding program, which is designed to breed blight resistance into American chestnut, takes about six generations. We start by crossing American with Chinese chestnut. Chinese chestnuts are a source of blight resistance. And then we spend five or six more generations of breeding to get to a tree that is mostly American, but also has the blight resistance from Chinese chestnuts. So this morning we're planting trees that are partway through our breeding program, but have also been crossed with wild trees from Connecticut and actually I think the most of the nuts we're planting this morning were bred uh, by crossing a tree in Granby, Connecticut. And so we'll be planting those out here and letting them grow for a few years and then we'll kind of move on to our next step of breeding which will be selecting the best trees and letting them cross. So prior to the late 1800s American chestnut was a fairly common hardwood species uh, in the eastern U.S. It was uh, about 4 billion stems on about 200 million acres ranging from Maine to Georgia. And in the late 1800s, we accidentally introduced a fungal pathogen we call chestnut blight. And that was first in, or identified in 1904 in uh, New York City and spread very quickly within about 50 years through the entire range of the American chestnut. Uh, this Prior to blight, chestnut was used for pretty much anything you can use wood for. It's a very straight grain, rot resistant, fast growing hardwood tree. So telephone poles, light railroad ties, uh, it wasn't often a veneer wood, but it was the backbone for a lot of wood products. Pulp wood, uh, it's high in tannins, so you could extract the tannins and use that for the leather tanning industry. Um, and of course the nuts are nutritious and tasty, so humans and wildlife alike relied on that as a, as a food source. Um, unfortunately the blight wiped out our, our, Amer our American chestnuts. Uh, they do re-sprout from the root system, so we haven't lost them completely, but they don't really tend to hang on long enough to flower and reproduce naturally. So our breeding program is aimed to breed enough resistance to this pathogen into these trees so we can put them back in the forest and have them start participating in the ecosystem and providing a lot of those benefits that they were providing prior to blight. So this orchard is home to three what we call breeding lines, which are crosses between blight resistant or potentially partially blight resistant pollen from our research farm in Virginia and wild trees that we find in Connecticut. What we'll do here is actually allow these trees to grow to a certain size and we'll actually challenge every tree in this orchard with chestnut blight fungus. We actually make a little hole in the bark, put the, uh, the blight fungus in there, and then we look at which trees have the best response, that do the, have the most resistance, can kind of contain that, that blight canker, and also look the most like an American chestnut. Those trees will be selected, everything else actually gets removed. They cross and make our next generation of nuts, which go into one more orchard before we get to what we hope is the end of our breeding program. Um, we do have a research farm in Virginia that is um, staffed. Most of our work in New England is all, vol actually all of our work in New England is volunteer. Um, our research farm has trees that have come through our whole breeding program and we're starting to get those out for forest testing um, and eventually once we have similar material from our breeding program in Connecticut we'll be putting those out in the forest and starting to see how they do under much more natural conditions. I mean clearly this is a field, this isn't exactly where you would expect American chestnuts to be so we want to know once we have trees we think are blight resistant and American in character how they actually do in the forest so we can gauge how well we've done and if we have to keep moving or if we're ready to repopulate um, the forest. So Dan here is assembling blue X tubes. These are tree shelters for our chestnut seeds. Uh, what we actually do when we plant is we put a little bit of soilless planting media in each planting hole that provides a weed free germination environment for the seed. Then we put one of these shelters sunk about two or three inches into the ground um, secured with two bamboo stakes and that actually it gives the, the seed a nice place to germinate. Um, the blue actually filters in um, UV light that's good for photosynthesis and the shelter being sunk actually helps prevent voles from getting at the base of the trees. Here Robin and Dave are putting soilless planting media into these already pre augered planting holes and they'll be planting the chestnut, actually it looks like they've already planted, so now they're securing the Bluex shelter over the nut, sinking it a few inches so that keeps the voles from being able to tunnel right into the roots and the, uh, the bamboo stakes are going to help keep these guys in place. Um, I should say the shelters are kind of short in part because we have a deer fence so those are not protecting against deer. The fence is doing that so we don't need to use anything real tall. Um, and then we'll come back 
behind them with a, uh, a clothespin and just pinch the top of that to make a nice little greenhouse until the nut actually sprouts.